All right. Jonah chapter 4. But before we get started, we're going to go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to um, close out the book of Jonah. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word, how it's been preserved over the uh, couple thousand years. And Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of being able to read it and study it and share it and learn from it. So I just thank you for the men that are here in this room. I pray, Lord, that you continue to minister to them uniquely in the way that they need to hear from your word. Um, I'm sure, Lord, as I share your word, uh, everyone here in the room is going to possibly hear something just slightly different, something that will maybe impact them or uh, benefit them in some form or fashion. And Lord, we pray for the ladies also over in the main sanctuary uh, going through their teaching. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and encourage them as well. And Lord, we just pray for safety on the roads as we leave here and go home tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. 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 All right, as I mentioned, Jonah chapter 4, we did 1, 2, and 3 in 2018, so we're going to wrap up this book and start into another series of minor prophet books for the most of 2019. So this slide I had shown before, and I believe even uh, Steve Kyle uh, borrowed it for one teaching that he was doing earlier in Jonah. So just as a reminder to see where Jonah shows up um, Chronologically, I guess you could look at it, all the big green blocks are what we call, you know, the minor prophets. And Steve talked about, you know, they aren't really any less important than the major prophets. Their books are just shorter. Uh, it's kind of a, their delineation or differentiation. But Jonah seems to be right along the lines of, uh, right there with Joel and Amos, is the, the first of the minor prophets, way back to beginning around 850 B.C., according to this slide. So early on, a long time ago, 2019 plus 850 years, a long time ago. It's amazing how things that happened then, you've heard people say, are not all that much different than the way things are now. All right, so if we were to try to break down all four chapters and give them just a short subheading, you could think of chapter one as the storm. And with the storm, if you actually go back and reread chapter 1, you'll see the word down a couple different times. And we see in chapter 1, uh, Jonah going down to Joppa, leaving uh, where he was at. And then also once he got to Joppa and decided to board the ship to go to Tarshish, um, he went down into the ship and ended up falling asleep. Uh, and then chapter 2, if we were to give it a short title, we could say, you know, the, the story of the big fish. Um, and in that chapter, we see Jonah going down into the fish's belly and then down to the bottom of the ocean. Um, we'll talk about whether Jonah was maybe dead or alive at, at this point. Uh, we've heard a, a couple different ideas, and I'm now tending towards the idea of it, that he was probably dead and was resurrected at some point. Uh, Jonah, uh, Jonah chapter 3, we could characterize that as the city. Um, you know, Jonah is spit up by the whale onto some shore there in the Mediterranean, and now he's um, making his way uh, inland and making his way to Assyria and entering the big city of Nineveh. And he's starting his 40-day missionary trek across the city and spreading the gospel, essentially, telling people to, to repent or, I think he said, repent or die. Um, so, uh, and they listen. And that's where we're going to pick up at the end of chapter 3. There's one verse before we uh, jump into, well, I'll read chapter 4, verse 1, then I'll backtrack to verse uh, 10, I believe, of chapter 3. But in that chapter 4, we can categorize it as the Lord, uh, meaning, you know, this is where Jonah kind of has a back and forth dialogue. Uh, actually, the Lord speaking to Jonah, uh, not once, but twice, at least during this, this time. And we learn a lot about Jonah. So I would say, if you were to even go back to around the time of Jonah 1, but before all this happened, Jonah knew something. He knew something this whole time from chapter 1 uh, to chapter 4. He knew God was wholeheartedly compassionate to all victims. We'll see, I mean, if you remember, just think about 1, 2, and 3, chapters 1, 2, and 3, what we know has happened, especially in chapter 3. Uh, he knows God is compassionate to all victims. Jonah knew God as a father to the fatherless. Jonah knew God cares for the widows. God knew, or Jonah knew God cared for the poor. 
And Jonah knew that God loves the abusers, not just the abused. So Assyrians, as we've brought up in the previous chapters, were very ruthless and cruel when they captured uh, people. Um, so they were uh, the abusers, and Jonah definitely knew about many of these stories, I'm sure, because he really hated the Ninevites. And we learned and knew about in chapter 3 that he was just hoping God would not be merciful um, to the Ninevites, but God was, because of these things that Jonah already knew about God. We just don't really see this side of Jonah. He knows it, and but he's mad about it still because of the, I don't know if he had some sort of personal relationship or personal connection somehow to some people that may have, um, in, in time past, been killed by the Ninevites. Uh, we don't know all that backstory. I guess we can ask and find him someday and ask him in heaven uh, why he was so against the Ninevites being saved. Because what actually happens, I'll mention it later, was something that missionaries would just praise God for. Because we got all these ruthless sinners, this whole country essentially comes to the Lord. Um, so, I mean, why wouldn't you be happy about that if you're a prophet, a man of God? So, wow, I mean, we find out that he was really disturbed about this. Uh, so think about Jonah now for a few seconds. Again, through the, up, the chapters 1, 2, and 3 that we've already discussed... We know he's a little bit selfish. We're going to see that especially in chapter 4. Uh, we know he's vindictive and vengeful. We saw that in chapter 3 a little bit. He's immature. At least we kind of get his, in today's terminology, I'm going to use the term a little bit later in the teaching, that he may be a little bit bipolar. I mean, he just he, he jumps back and forth between totally upset and totally glad uh, about some weird things. We'll see in chapter 4. Um, and yet God used him for one of the greatest revival that Scripture ever records. So we got hundreds of thousands of people in Nineveh that essentially accept Christ, that believe in the gospel message that Jonah went there to share. Uh, they turn to the Lord. So that, gave us, that should give us some sort of encouragement to know that God used someone like Jonah to just save this whole nation, a, a very sinful nation, and they came to the Lord. So that's kind of my uh, backdrop intro to getting started into Jonah chapter 4, uh, verse 1. So here it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So Jonah perceived that it was equal to being evil that God would allow the Ninevites to be granted this mercy that we read about in the previous verse. So why was he so displeased, exceedingly displeased? Um, so if I back up to Jonah 3, verse 10, is where it ended in chapter 3. It says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that He had said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. So then Jonah was very displeased, exceedingly displeased. So what would make, as I alluded to, you know, what would have made evangelists and missionaries in the world exceedingly happy they would be very happy about something like this, right? But it made Jonah steaming hot. He was exceedingly displeased over the situation. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So we see here, I've underlined five different things uh, here Jonah showcases about God. First, that he was gracious. So if you remember kind of a short definition of what grace is, it's when you um, get what you don't deserve. So it's when you actually get something, usually good, that you feel you're not deserving of. That's God's grace pouring out upon you. So Jonah recognizes God is gracious. He recognizes God is merciful. So mercy, again, the short definition would be when you don't get what you deserve, when you know you've done something, when you've done something wrong, when you've sinned maybe, uh, and you know you should get a whooping, you should get some sort of punishment, but you don't. That's God's mercy. And then he says, God is slow to anger. Um, there's probably several different verses that we could go to, if I, uh, but for some reason I was gravitated toward... Um, 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering. Long-suffering means He was very slow and decisive 
toward us. We've waited 2,000 plus years now for a second coming, and it hasn't happened yet. There's probably been a, a, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist in every, probably every decade, but certainly every century that thought, this is the century God has got to be coming back. He's got to be coming back in 180. He's got to be coming back in 280, in 380, uh, 480, and so on and so on, all the way to 1900. He is long-suffering. He's slow to anger. There's been so many things that he would have just liked to start over again like he did back in Noah's day uh, with the flood, but he didn't. He's very long-suffering, just waiting for everybody, all the Gentiles, to come to the Lord. There's going to be a day, though, when that last Gentile says, Lord, I accept you into my heart, boom, here comes uh, the Lord to take us back. But he's long-suffering, slow to anger, um, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what I was thinking of when I said, or thought of slow to anger. But then he's also uh, abundant in loving kindness um, and relents from doing harm. So it's interesting that Jonah lists these things that really bug him about God. This doesn't make sense, does it? How could you not like your mother, your father, your sister, your son, your daughter to be gracious and merciful and slow to anger? being loving and relent from doing harm. Aren't those good qualities? And Jonah's peed. He's upset. He's exceedingly angry that God is these things. Again, a little bipolar maybe. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Next verse. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? He's saying, if you're going to forgive sinners like these Ninevites, just put me out of my misery. I think Jonah certainly has his priorities a, a little bit out of whack. I mean, I've already alluded to the fact that most people would be exceedingly happy about these things, uh, about God that he's quoting and thinking of. Um, so this is a great example of how stubborn Jonah is and how really ungrateful he is. Uh, so in just a few short days, uh, 40 days at most, because I believe back in chapter 2, we read about him coming into the, uh, I guess, uh, beginning of chapter 3 was where he was coming into the city and he was going to be spreading his gospel message for 40 days. You know, 40 days or die type message. So it's not a big amount of time that all of this is uh, transpiring after he was vomited out of the, well even, after, even from the time when he left his city, went down to Joppa, got on the boat, all that happened fairly quickly uh, in a few days time. Three more days in the fish's belly, and then up on the shore, and off he went to Nineveh. Uh, and then 40 days at most there. So in a few short days, possibly, we see Jonah going from crying out to God to save him from the belly of the fish, uh, to now asking the Lord to take his life. So we're going to see this swing back and forth a couple of times in this chapter 4. Where he goes from, God just kill me, to, wow, he's happy, and I got this plant to sit under now. This is just some weird things uh, that Jonah's uh, going to be showing us. So, verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would, would become of the city. So Jonah doesn't like what God is saying to him in the city. So he goes out to the east side of the city. Jonah doesn't wait and give God an answer. Uh, I believe um, right here it says the Lord said. So God is talking to Jonah and he's asking Jonah, which usually implies, yeah, Lord, an answer. I mean, Jonah doesn't give God an answer. Can you imagine kind of rebuking or just turning your back on God and leaving the city? God just asked you a question. He said, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah just went out of the city. We don't hear, we don't hear him replying back to God. And coming up with an excuse probably is all he would have done uh, about you know, why he was so upset. But it was just interesting that he just leaves. Jonas is, is giving God, you know, the kind of the silent treatment. So maybe you could think of Jonah as the pouting prophet. <laughs> so it makes me wonder if he was friends of um, Jeremiah, because we read in the weeping, the weeping prophet. It's kind of a nickname that Jeremiah had. Uh, I, I guess I didn't go back and look where, where is Jonah? Uh, they weren't even contemporary. You can see Jeremiah is way over there, uh, 600 B.C., so... They weren't friends. They didn't even know about each other. Well, Jeremiah may have known about Jonah, uh, but that's about it. 
What else? So we see God speaking to a human being, God speaking to Jonah in this uh, previous verse. And what did this human being do? He just turned his back on God and walked out outside the city. He didn't answer God. Uh, can you imagine that? Have you ever heard of another human being ever not listening to God before? Probably we've all done that in some form or fashion. <laughs> yep. Giving God the silent treatment. God, how could you do this? Or why did you do that? <laughs> what do you mean? Seriously? What are you talking about? Yep. That's, so that's what we see Jonah doing. Jonah then decides, as it says here, to, to build himself a booth or a shelter or a lean-to to wait to see if anything changes. Maybe hoping that the Lord... Uh, would change his mind and then punish the Ninevites. That's kind of what he's really waiting for. He's hoping maybe he's up on a hill and uh, going to be looking down into the city and just waiting for fire and brimstone to come down like Sodom and Gomorrah type of thing. But that didn't happen either. So we see Jonah continuing to be very stubborn and showing a huge lack of compassion, holding out hope that God would still judge Nineveh. The story continues. And the Lord God prepared a plant in some versions it may say like a gourd, and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. At the end of chapter 1, we see God prepared a great fish. So here I underline, you know, God prepared a plant. Here in chapter 4, we see God preparing this plant on this gourd. Uh, when we refuse to listen to God, he has more than one way to speak to us. So he's going to kind of try to speak to Jonah through this, uh, this plant. And we're going to see how Jonah reacts to it uh, also in just, again, a, a, just a matter of one day's time. Uh, God can speak through circumstances. God can arrange these circumstances. So Jonah is right exactly where God wanted him to be. Aren't we all exactly, all the time, right where God wants us to be? No matter what we're going through, or what situation we think is insurmountable, God has us there for a reason, to grow us, to mature us uh, for some future event. I mean, I was just listening to a podcast the other day, and it was just, uh, they were just elucidating or illuminating the fact that, you know, if you're still drawing breath, if you're still sucking wind, if you can still fog up a mirror, God has not decided to take you home yet. Why? Because, you, I mean, if you believe, if you're in the faith, I think, it's because you have some other purpose that you haven't completed yet. I think it's, it's nice to know that hopefully we all have some sort of purpose that we're here on earth for some reason. Uh, it may be hard to believe that sometimes, but uh, we're all, uh, what's that term, where we just won't ever die. Uh, in, uh, immortal. Immortal. Until God, until we finish that task that we're put on earth to do. Uh, and then, then God will take us home. So God will arrange these circumstances um, to get us into a situation where he can actually talk to us, to speak to us, hopefully to get us to listen. And, and, and God is going to be, he's already spoke to Jonah once, he's going to be speaking to him here again in, in just a minute. So right now Jonah is exceedingly glad for this plan. Remember just a few verses ago, he was exceedingly angry. Now he's exceedingly glad, not wanting to die now, he's happy now. He's not thinking about dying at this point. So how strange this seems since just a bit ago, Jonah was exceedingly angry and hot that God has not smoked the Ninevites. So what happens next? But as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered and died. Now God prepared this worm, a great worm, to devour the plant. <clears throat> So I, I can just see myself as, as Jonah kind of looking over at the worm, and the worm just kind of goes, eh, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I saw a big plant here, a big gourd, it looked juicy to me, so I started chomping on it. Who knows how big this worm was, if it was just a normal sized worm, or you know, one of those big fat tomato worms uh, that started chomping on this, uh, this plant. But it, uh, whatever happened, it, it damaged it enough that it uh, withered and died. Verse 8, And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. So 
Here we go again. Now Jonah swings back to wanting to die again. <clears throat> I think this guy may have, again, I said I've used this term, may have been a little bit bipolar if, we, if he were to be examined by a doctor today. I'm just saying he has some pretty drastic mood swings. Uh, pretty drastic. I think we can get things way out of perspective when we are not willing to listen to God, listen to the Lord. Um, again, we can all probably think of situations uh, where we, uh, in hindsight, would look back and recognize that, you know, if we would only listen to that still, small voice in the back of our head that was nagging at us, saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and we still did it. And then a day later, an hour later, a minute later, we're regretting it. Um, so Jonah... Uh, was was there, and the, and the Lord is pointing these things out. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. So now he's really giving it back to the Lord and saying, Yeah, I have a right. I want to die. He, he, he's really being kind of forceful about this, and he's still really angry and wanting to die now over just a plant. That was providing a little bit of shade. For all we know, he still has the booth, the little lean-to hut thing that he could go back into if he's really hot and bothered to get out of the sun. Um, but he, he really liked that plant for some reason, but the plant's dead now, and now he's back to being angry and wanting to die. Wow, what a shift. Um, so God is speaking to Jonah again, and Jonah responds so ungratefully, claiming he has all the right to be angry, even to death. Jonah's anger did not arise from a de desire for justice, but from his own selfishness. So again, he just wanted the shade and a little bit of coolness that the plant was offering. Uh, but yet at the same time, I think, you could just go back into his booth. That's probably still right next to him. But the Lord said, you have, had, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. So God is pointing out to Jonah the futility of of his words about the plant, because Jonah played no part in growing or nurturing the plant. Additionally, God was trying to introduce perspective into Jonah's life, that his pity party over the passing of the plant was actually somewhat ridiculous compared to the rescuing of the hundreds of thousands of people uh, that we're going to read in the next verse there in Nineveh. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. So God's drawing out there's at least 120 persons who can, don't know their left from their right, so probably children. And he's saying, pointing out there's a lot of livestock here too. So God's pointing out to Jonah how wrong it was for him to have pity on the plant that grew up in a day and died in a day and not have compassion on the thousands of people that God wanted to save in Nineveh. And God here also recognizes the hierarchy of importance. You know, people are more important than animals, and animals are more important than plants. Um, so God was trying to make Jonah see the error in his thinking. I don't know if Jonah was real open to it, um, but that's certainly what God was trying to point out. So God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Again, we alluded to how the Ninevites were certainly a, a wicked group of people. And his goal, like a, in that 2 Peter 3, 9 verse, is he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Um, so he gave the Ninevites the opportunity to hear, to respond, and to listen to Jonah's message. And they did. Jonah didn't know if they were going to. He hoped that they wouldn't. God kind of knew that they might, they would. Uh, and they did. So he decided not to to wipe out the civilization. So that's, that was kind of the story there in Jonah chapter 4. <clears throat> so the book of Jonah ends on this note of contrast between Jonah's ungracious heart and the kind heart of the Lord. Jonah is, one, is the one that writes this book and of his own foolishness and fleeing from the Lord. Can you imagine, I mean this was a, a, a first person biography of what he did. He didn't leave out, you know, again, as Pastor David and others have shared from the main stage, the Bible doesn't leave out some of these truly, possibly embarrassing stories and situations in our life. He just shares everything. 
Jonah shared everything, things that would make a normal person blush and be ashamed of themselves for doing in hindsight. When he looked back on this, uh, I, I can imagine that, you know, this is kind of a weird way to end this book. I mean, and much livestock. And it, that's just kind of the end of it. And I, I can just imagine, you know, when Jonah decided to, after all this had taken place, he probably went back to his home country, and the Holy Spirit inspired him to write down the book of Jonah. Chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. He wrote it all out. And then I can just see him out of maybe disgust or embarrassment or something and just taking the, the pen and the quill that he was writing with and just setting it down. And Man, I can't believe it. I wrote it out and I can't believe I did that. But I wonder what he was thinking as he finished writing this book and how he really felt about himself. But through the ins inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he had to write this out for our benefit, right? 2019 plus 850 years later, we can see ourselves in Jonah's personality in, in, in many situations. But through him, like I alluded to, hundreds of thousands of people were saved through his willingness to finally obey God after getting Albino, albinoized, because <laughs> I'm sure when he came out of the fish's belly for almost three days, uh, he had to have a, a slime and just pigment was probably eaten away from his body. If you think that there's some sort of acid in this big fish's belly, just like in our stomach, um, somehow we survived. Um, but yeah, it was just an amazing story how he uh, had to walk up with, through the city looking the way he did sharing a message that he, in the back of his mind, was hoping that they would not receive, but they did. And then him penning this book. It was pretty amazing. In Matthew 12, 41, Jesus, Jesus points out the importance of forgiveness. So we see God is a very forgiving person, as Jonah pointed out earlier. So I was going to read a couple passages here from verse 38 to 41. Even the evil Ninevites that repented due to the preaching of Jonah, Jesus is going to point out in this book of Matthew, chapter 12. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So Jesus is in a crowd, certainly with some Pharisees here, and they ask him a question. Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So the Pharisees asking for some sort of sign is actually a sign of unbelief. Uh, it's actually a sign of their, their weak faith, looking for some sort of sign. Uh, but Jesus kind of goes a step further and says, um, I won't give you anything except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then you may be asking, well, what is this sign of the prophet Jonah? Jonah. Um, and so Jesus goes on and in the very next verse kind of answers the question. If you kind of read between the lines a little bit, uh, not too much has to be interpreted. Uh, but in verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of God be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So when we think about Jesus going through the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, we know what happened during that time. Got, Jesus was crucified, died, buried. He was buried for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And was resurrected, came back to life. So looking at the grammar and the way this verse is structured, um, so the, the same way that Jesus was dead and buried for three days and three nights, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So there's... An indication here that the sign of Jonah, the sign is actually speaking of resurrection. We know that Jesus was certainly resurrected, and it's somewhat clear that it's very alluding to this, the fact or implying that Jonah may not have physically been alive during those three days in the belly of the fish for a portion of the time. I'm sure he was, because even in one in chapter three, I believe it was, he said that he. After three days, he prayed. So he was there for three days. So I don't know if you, again, this is going out on speculation. So those listening, those watching later after this is teaching and those in here, it, this 
verse 40 speculates that for a portion of time he may have been dead and then resurrected maybe right before he was spit out on the shore. And that's when he did the, the prayer and then he got spit out on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. So it's, it just speaks to me that he was dead for some portion of time in the fish's belly. And then verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So remember Jesus is saying these words to the Pharisees. The men of Nineveh were a, a great and evil civilization. Even they at somewhat disgruntled, not very enthusiastic preaching by Jonah. I'm sh I can't imagine what Jonah was looking like when he was, or what his uh, body language was like when he was walking through Nineveh. What were the actual words that he, I didn't go back and re in, when he was walking through Nineveh and he was or saying 40 days or die. Was it just something that short? I can't remember what the actual words were in verse or in chapter 3 when he was walking through Nineveh, but I can't imagine when he was walking through the city, he was, you know, had some sort of hood over his head, his head down, just kind of yelling, and he may have been yelling and screaming this, or I don't know how compassionate he was about it, but I can imagine he wasn't very enthused about this mission that he was put on. Again, because he was, he really hated the Ninevites. So how passionate was he about sharing this message? Yeah, it says, then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and none of us shall be overthrown. And that's about it. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And he's just repeating that, repeating that, repeating that. Was he saying it in a nice way? How can you say that in a nice way? <laughs> uh, but he, he said something. So it wasn't like a long, drawn-out teaching and expositing <clears throat> on some sort of grace and mercy gospel presentation. So the Ninevites heard what he said and they still responded to it. How amazing is that? I mean, he wasn't a really eloquent speaker that we're told. And he didn't have a long uh, speech that he gave. Like we've heard Jesus share many um, uh, long speeches in, in Scripture. But it says here, uh, because they repented preaching, due to the preaching of Jonah, and they would uh, rise up in judgment with this generation condemned. Why? Because they had much less of information being shared with them than what Jesus was trying to share with the his current um, population that was surrounding him, the, the, the Pharisees and, and the people alike. So it's just um, amazing that Jesus was really, really condemning the Pharisees for not believing as much as the sinful Ninevites did. Um, so that was, I just wanted to bring up that passage because it talked about the resurrection and it talks about uh, Jesus speaking to this group of Pharisees who were not as faithful as we would think they should be. So what would I want to leave us with, kind of in the form of a life lesson? God won't violate our will, but He will make us willing. you probably heard that before. And you speak of, I mean, that's kind of what He did with Jonah. He didn't necessarily, He kind of broke Jonah's will in, in, in a way, didn't He? I mean, He kind of took him out, He let him get on the ship. He didn't prevent him from going to the ship and just send him straight to Nineveh. He let him kind of go his own way for a little while, but he kind of made such circumstances happen that he got off the ship and got in the right direction. So he won't really necessarily violate our will all the time. He's going to let us make choices and choose a direction. But he will make us eventually willing. Uh, again, not all of us will choose to become believers. Um, so in that, in that sense, he's not going to really violate our will. He'll just get us in a position where we can then finally make that choice. Jonah knew something, didn't he? This is kind of a repeat of what I said earlier. So now just kind of close your eyes and think of all four chapters here and think about where Jonah knew God was wholeheartedly compassionate to all victims. Jonah knew God is a father to the fatherless. Think of all those 120 kids that God mentioned to, to bring to Jonah's attention. Jonah knew God cares for the widows and the poor. Think of all those thousands of people, mothers and fathers of those 120 kids. 
God was looking after them too. Jonah knew God loves the abusers, the Ninevites, and not just the abused, all of their victims. Jonah knew God fights against sin, not against the people. So he, God was really about the sin that the Ninevites were performing, that were, they were long-standing and doing. He was not fighting against the people. That's why he had compassion and mercy on the people and wanted them to hear Jonah's message. And I'll leave you with this. Having a God we don't always understand is a good thing that we need to learn to be okay with. You know, if our God was so small that we could understand or figure out everything that, why He's doing, everything that He does in our life, if we didn't have questions in the back of our mind about, why did you do that, God, ten years ago? Or why are you doing that now in my son's or daughter's life? Or why did you do that to me when I was in college because now I'm ended up this way? Whatever that is, if we had a God so small that we could figure out and knew what the exact black and white answer was all the time, uh, it wouldn't be a God worth, which, worth following and serving. Um, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Um, is, is a good thing to remember at all times because we won't know answers to everything until heaven someday. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this chapter. Lord, I pray there was something in, in it for each and every one of us. Um, we all may see a little bit of ourselves in Jonah. You know, the selfishness, the lack of compassion sometimes. <clears throat> Not willing to, to fully understand and hear maybe the other side of a person's story before we uh, choose to make judgment. Uh, Lord, help us to, to set that aside. Help us, Lord, to be more long-suffering and understanding and and slow to anger and compassionate. Uh, Lord, just uh, give us that um, ability, that supernatural ability to behave that way in all of our uh, relationships. And Lord, we um, just thank you for, again, your word and preserving it. And Lord, just go before us and help us, Lord, to continue to dig into your word and maybe go back and reread certain passages if we need to to um, just bring them to, to our forefront, to our, our memory more often. And, Lord, we just thank you again. Uh, help us, Lord, to, to follow you always and do things that would honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Amen.